talk a bit about brain functioning and think about that in relation to behaviour. Um, I'm going to think a little bit about adolescence in particular because neuroscience the research in the area of adolescent brain development has really grown exponentially in the last 25 years and we now understand quite a bit more about what's happening in the brain during adolescence and it's quite fascinating so I'm going to talk to you a little bit about that research and I'll think a little bit specifically then about what that means for kids particularly with ADHD. Um, and then I'm going to spend quite a bit of time thinking about how to manage behaviour and in particular a bit of a focus on your relationship with your child. So I think when I was planning this talk I kind of thought gosh you guys really are experts in ADHD and I watched Katia Ruby, Rubin's um, talk about neuroscience and I'm like wow well I can't beat that. She's really, so you, you I, I thought I'm really going to focus today on thinking about behaviour and thinking about how to manage behaviour um, because Alice, Alistair was just saying that's what you're all dealing with, um, often the thing that is most problematic. So if we think a little bit first of all about neuroscience, as I was saying, our understanding of brain development has grown so much in the last 20 or 30 years because we now have these amazing technologies that enable us to look at the brain not only while people are alive but also while getting people to do specific tasks. So we have this MRI scan and you can put people in a scan and scan their brain and we look to see where blood flow or electrical activity is in the brain and get these, these really pretty pictures and you can get them to do things, you can get people to read a word or to have an emotional experience, take a picture of the brain and you can even take a video of the brain getting them to do something. So our knowledge of the brain has grown so much and it, we used to think until fairly recently that um, brain development mostly went on in the first few years of life and some people of my age who did a psychology degree will have read in their textbooks that most of brain development happens and finishes around the age of three or four and then the brain was pretty much fixed. Well we now know that that is absolutely not true. The period of brain development is now estimated to be around 25 years is a long long time and actually this whole idea of 18 that you're an adult by 18 has really been completely blown out of the water. Uh, the brain is plastic, that the brain changes in response to experience. So we know that the brain has this quality of neuroplasticity that's actually there for the whole of our lives. We all have a plastic brain that's why we're all able to learn new things but this period of developmental plasticity when the brain is particularly responsible to experience goes on for the first 25 years of life a really really long time so we just think for a minute about a brain about brain development so what we know about the brain is that it's made up of billions and billions of these neurons here is a neuron here they you can't see them to the naked eye but there are billions of them and the brain is born very very immature and goes on developing for, for very many years. But the difference between an immature brain and a mature brain is not the number of neurons. You don't grow more neurons. What happens is you connect neurons together. So the first time you do anything, for anything new, what you do is you make a pathway in the brain. So the first time you hit a tennis ball, you read a word, you're, you're making pathways as, we, as, we, um, as you're listening to me now. This, the first time you have a thought, you make this pathway. And then every time you do that thing again, that pathway becomes more efficient. So what happens in the pathway is an electrical signal is sent down it, and then you do it again and that same pathway gets reinforced. And something happens called myelination. It's a bit like insulating your roof this fatty acid gets wrapped around this pathway and it becomes really, really efficient. And that is, you know, you, you will have heard of the 10,000 hour rule. Have you heard about that? In order to get really good at something, they say we, we estimate that you have to spend 10,000 hours doing it. Well, this fits really well with what we know about brain development. That actually, in order to be good at anything, you have to do it again and again and again. So, what happens then is that cells connect many, many, many times and that's what we call learning. So 
So every time you have a significant new thought, your brain creates new neural pathways. And this is a real-time brain scan showing a new neural pathway being made. Oh yeah, did you see that? Now they're going to show it in slow motion. You see these two neurons attracted to each other and then something gets sent across the pathway and they get connected. Yeah. It's quite amazing, isn't it, to see. I mean, I think it's amazing for us to see, but I think it's also amazing for children to see, and particularly to give them this idea that actually the first time you do something, you're not gonna, no one's ever gonna be good at anything they do the first time. You know, have, you have this idea, you're really good at maths, you're really good at, you know, you're really good at sports. Nobody is really good at anything the first time you do it because you don't have a brain pathway. And some of you may have heard of a fixed mindset and the growth mindset, have you heard about that? It's this idea from Carol Dweck, and that really fits with this idea we have a fixed mindset, this idea that you're just good at something or you aren't. Actually, we need to be teaching our kids that always to have a growth mindset. And that also when you do something, first of all, you know, you get really frustrated and you can't do it. You can say to them, yeah, that's because you've got no pathway yet. We've got to build the pathway. So I think that's something that's um, very helpful to know about brain development. Something that's a little bit more depressing, perhaps, for us adults is this graph, which shows age going along the bottom. And what it shows is that the brain's ability to change in response to the experience goes down throughout our lives. And the amount of effort in order to make those changes increases. So what that means is that we all have the ability to learn new things, but children have this developmental plasticity, their brain is much more ready to learn new things. So if you've ever tried to learn something alongside your teenager, as I have, we we're trying to learn jazz piano together. They learned it much quicker than I did. And I'd go, well, that's not fair because you've got that really good brain plasticity. And they'd go, yeah, but mum, you don't practice. And they were right, actually. <laughs> <laughs> so what this means is that the brain literally, our um, experience builds this brain architecture over this period of 25 years. And just to show you what happens is that um, at different parts of the brain at different times, you'll see this is a slice of the brain at the different ages. There's approximately the same number of neurons, these kind of neuron heads, but the brain makes lots and lots and lots of connections and then the, the connections that are not needed get pruned away. They get rid of them at the end of brain development. So you see this in different parts of the brain. So this is the amazing thing about brains. They are adapting to the environment in which they live. So the brain says, I'll, do, I'll keep that connection because I need it. So somebody who's living in the rainforest is going to have a very, very different brain to somebody who's living like in a, in a town. I mean, I think one of the other amazing things is that our brains evolved to develop in the context of relationships, and we know that because nature has made this choice to give babies this very, very immature brain, but you need to have an adult in your life for these 25 years in order for your brain to develop. And we see this now, more and more research is showing the importance of relationships, not only in early childhood. You know that serve and return that they talk about in early childhood? The baby does something and then needs a response from the adult. The recent research, and I was just listening to a podcast on the way here, talking about the importance of relationships. Our brains are so fundamentally social that social coding and relationships is of primary importance. And in Maslow's hierarchy of needs, people would now, I think, put relationships on the bottom. You can't really survive and develop unless you have relationships. And that's going to be important for what we're going to be talking about today. So one of the things to think about, um, one of the things I'm really going to be emphasizing today when we're thinking about behavior is that behavior is a form of communication. And I'm going to be saying that again and again and again. So we need to think a little bit about brain functioning, because if we can understand where in the brain the child is functioning, we can answer this question, why are they beh behaving the way they do? And you will often, I think, be asking that about your child. Why did you do that? Why did you behave like that? So if we think about how the brain functions, we might be able to answer that question. So this is a brain um, from, from the sides. We've got two sides of the brain. This is looking at the side of the brain. And you can divide the brain into three broad regions. 
according to its function. So at the bottom of the brain, this is for children and adults, we have this bit of the brain here which um, is very important. It's called the instinctual bit of the brain. It's the bit of the brain that keeps us safe. So when we are in fight or flight, this is the bit of the brain that is doing, the, where the functioning is com coming from. So um, when a baby is born, this is a bit of the brain that is most well developed. And actually the brain develops from the bottom to the top. So you know when kids do that moral reflex, this is where it's coming from. So when you are functioning in this part of the brain, you are not doing any thinking. You are just reacting. It's the bit of the brain that keeps us safe. Then in the middle there's a set of structures here that's called the limbic region and this is also very, very important, it's got some very basic functioning. One of the things it's got is our emotional processing, something called the amygdala. It's where we process fear, it's where we house our memory and memory is very close to the emotional bit of the brain because if something frightening has happened to us before we need to remember it for next time. It's also the bit of the brain that tells us whether we're hungry or we're thirsty. Then over the top, this bit over the top is called the cortex and this is where the kind of more intelligent parts of the brain. So different bits of it, like the back bit has got vision and then there are, there are parts that are devoted to language. Um, but this is where we do all of our thinking in, in the cortex. And that is more well developed in humans than in any other mammal. So most mammals have the instinctual brain, they have the limbic part of the brain, but you'll see animals, like particularly dogs, if you see dogs, you give them a bit of food, they don't think, oh, actually I'm, hungry. I'm not hungry because I've eaten already, do they? They don't have any kind of thinking part of their brain like we do. They just act according to their instinct. So action and thought connect neurons, making a complex pathways, connecting different parts of the brain together. And if we think about which bit of the brain is dominating, that tells us something about the function, about what's happening in terms of our behavior. So we need to know what part of the brain is dominating in order to understand a child's behavior, or indeed an adult's behavior. So imagine if you were sitting here now and suddenly you were to smell something, you were to smell burning, you would register this so you would get the sense it would come in through your um, smell, one of your senses, your limbic system would start to register fear. It would start to say, I'm in danger. Then your behavior will probably change. Some of you might start to scream. Some of you might shout fire. You might get up and start move up and start leaving the room. But you would stop thinking. However interesting what I was saying was, was you would stop thinking about what I was talking about because you would be in your lower brain. You would be functioning in your fear brain and your processing your behavior goes down into your fight or flight you go into fight or flight or freeze so you've all seen this haven't you when you're with, with kids you've probably seen this when you're with yourself when you're very frightened about something your behavior you it, it, it goes into this more reactive mode rather than thinking mode if you're calm which I hope you are you're calm and content your lower brain says I'm safe and secure my kids are safe and secure everything's fine, you've eaten, you've had something to drink, um, you know, you're not too tired, then you're able to think. And actually, when I talk to teachers about that, we're always thinking about how to get kids into their thinking brain, not into their lower parts of their brain. So, somebody called Dan Siegel, has anybody ever read any of his books? Dan Siegel, no. He's written some great books, um, and one of them called, is called The Whole Brain Child, and he shows this hand model of the brain. You seen the hand model of the brain? Somebody over there is, yeah, anybody else? So if you just hold your hand up like this and you put your thumb over the bottom, this bit down here is the lower brain. This is where we have big emotions. So you put your fingers over the top and this is the cortex, this is your thinking brain. And what you'll see is the two are connected. So when we have a big emotion, we're connected to our thinking brain. But sometimes we flip our lids and that's when we're just in our big emotional brain. So you know when you lose it, when you lose it with your kids and the next day you go, I can't believe I said that. That's because you were in your lower brain. 
We all do it. But if you think about children in particular, children's brains are still developing. Um, so they really haven't nailed this at all. They haven't quite worked out how to manage their lower brain. So what this tells us is, when we think about this question, why does my child behave like that? We have to think about where in the brain the processing is going on. So when this primitive brain, this lower brain center is discontented, they keep children from thinking, from paying attention, and from learning. So there's no point when your child is in that lower brain, when they're having a tantrum, when they're having a meltdown, there's no point in saying to them, why did you do that? They wouldn't be able to tell you because all of the functioning is in their lower brain. It's being sent down into fight or flight. It's not in the thinking brain. If you're tired or hunger, hungry and all of the kind of emotions, if you feel unsafe or threatened, all of those are going to pull lower brain functioning. And that's why you find sometimes when kids are really tired, they just can't do their homework. They can't because their brain is telling them they need to sleep because that is a primary function in the brain. Hunger, getting food is a primary function in the brain. There is no point in learning about maths if you're going to starve to death. That's the level at which your brain is working. So brain plasticity, when, when I talk about brain plasticity, I think we can easily get caught in this idea of, well, we've got to teach them a language and we've got to, you know, let's teach them lots and lots of skills. But actually, one of the opportunities we have during childhood is to strengthen this pathway between the lower brain, the emotional brain, and the thinking brain. And by adulthood, most of us have got to the place, hopefully, where when we have a big emotion, we don't act on it. And that's because we have this strong pathway between our lower brain and our thinking brain. And we've learned over the years to enact that pathway and we, we wait until later, don't we? We don't lose it. I mean, we do sometimes, but hopefully we don't. But we've got an opportunity to try and help our kids to develop those pathways. And I'm gonna talk a bit about how we might do that today. So when a child is having a tantrum, they're crying in pain, other form of extreme behavior is being shown. The important thing to remember is that they are not thinking. So I'm going to come back to that. I'm just going to talk a little bit about adolescence and tell you a little bit about what's going on in um, adolescent brain research. So adolescence is this period um, so which is from, well, it's, it's kind of defined as the time when you start puberty you know, which is um, kind of younger and younger these days, but somewhere between maybe 11, 12, 13. And it's supposed to end at the time when you become independent, which could be quite a long time for some people, but um, <laughs> maybe sometime in your 20s. And um, actually, a lot of this research was started by somebody called Sarah Jane Blakemore, who's just um, published a really great book um, about adolescent brain development called Inventing Yourself. Inventing Ourselves, maybe it's called. It literally just came out two weeks ago. I would really recommend it. And she was very interested in thinking about adolescence because while adolescence is the time in your life when you are most physically healthy, it is also the time when you are most likely to develop a mental health problem. So it's the time in your life when you are most likely to develop severe depression, schizophrenia, many of the very severe mental health difficulties. And she wanted to try and understand why. So um, she started, she, she did her PhD in this area, and then when she was going to do some more research, she started looking into it and realized we knew very little, actually, about what happens in typical brain development, let alone when things go wrong. And we had these new you know, MRI scans and things, and, and really, she has been one of the key people to start this. Now worldwide, there are labs who are, that, are, that are investigating um, adolescent brain development because it turns out it's a very, very important time. And whereas we know that those early years, of two to three, are a very important time for brain development, it turns out that adolescence is also a very, as, as sensitive a time as those early years. And that brings with it great risks, but also great opportunities, both. And that's what we're trying to understand. And you remember I said before that the brain doesn't all develop at the same time. The brain is ready to de for developing certain skills at certain ages. This is a brain from the top. So this is the back of the brain and the front of the brain, and it shows a brain scan going over development. So what you see is the blue bits on, on the brain are more mature and the 
kind of yellow and green bits are less mature. So the first things to come online here, this is where right at the back of your brain is the occipital lobe, which is where vision is. So the first thing to come on board is other senses, and there are these windows of opportunity when your brain is ready to develop your vision. Now, if you have a cataract, so um, and nobody picks up your cataract, so even though you've got perfectly good sight, your vision is occluded for those first few years, you will actually never develop sight um, quite in the same way as you might have done. Because the brain has this window of opportunity that kind of closes after that period of time. So you will develop some sight, but your sight will never be as strong as it could have been. So as we go through the brain, we see that there are different parts of the brain develop at different ages. And really crucially important for adolescents, the last bit of the brain to develop are these, are these frontal lobes here the prefrontal cortex, which is where we have these very important executive function skills. So the brain develops in cycles, there are these windows of opportunity for learning. It would be really helpful, wouldn't it, if we knew what bits of the brain are ready for development at what age. We're still trying to work those things out. We know the beginning is the senses, we know the end is the frontal lobes. We don't yet know what's a developmental window of opportunity for reading, for example, for maths. Wouldn't that be great? We're trying to work that out at the moment. When we think uh, a little bit just about children with ADHD, what we know about kids with ADHD is that it is these frontal lobes, the prefrontal cortex in particular, that, where, that develops more slowly than other parts of the brain. So this makes them... Um, um, particularly vulnerable, I think, during the teenage years because everybody's frontal cortex is going through redevelopment during adolescence and um, there are other changes that are going on that we'll talk about. Um, but given that there is plasticity, there's this window of opportunity in this part of the brain, maybe it's also an opportunity for us to help them develop these skills. So I'm just going to run through four kind of key messages from adolescent brain development. The first thing is that there is this potential for the development of these specialist skills and higher order processing because the executive function skills are developing at this time in the frontal cortex. So this is the brain again and you see the front part of the brain um, is going through significant development during adolescence. So who knows what the executive functions are? So it is this collection of processes that they are responsible for regulating and helping us to organize behavior, to select an appropriate goal, to respond. So as you know, children with executive function difficulties are often very, very bright. They have enormous cognitive capacity. Um, able, they're able to master the academic skills, but they just struggle with the processes of life. Um, they're often they're inconsistent, they're unpredictable, they lose things, um, they're poor at regulating their behaviour. The minute they get into school, they're in trouble because they can't sit still on the carpet. I, I can see you all going, yeah. <laughs> So one of the reasons that it's, I think, a difficulty with executive function skills is so confusing for adults is because it seems like they're more lower order skills, isn't it? I've definitely had many parents saying, I mean, he can't even remember his bag. How's he ever going to pass the GCSE exam? So you have to try and help uh, people really to understand that actually it's a set of skills that is specifically in one part of the brain and for some children they really struggle with that specifically even though they have many many skills in other areas so here is the list of them but actually quite interestingly you can look and see when they tend to develop over time so you can't see very well but this goes from years five all the way up to 22. So the first thing we expect in terms of executive function development is inhibition, the ability to, in, to inhibit your impulses. Then um, around six or seven, you increase your working memory and attention skills. In a child with ADHD, or is this? This is, no, this is typical. This is what we, the kind of typical expectation. Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, we might expect that the order would be similar in somebody with ADHD, but it might happen a bit later. Yeah, I mean, we know that this is a particular difficulty for them. 
But this is in terms of what we think about in terms of expectations, certainly expectations at school, um, this is what people are expecting. So those more higher order skills like organisation and planning and particularly something called metacognition which is your ability to reflect on your behaviour probably doesn't, you know, we didn't, wouldn't expect it to happen until much later on. And one of the things that we're doing um, with Connections in Mind um, is trying to really work to educate people about the executive function skills and what they are. We know that good executive function skills predict success in many areas of life. And many of you, have you heard of the marshmallow test? No. So some people have. So they, many, many years ago, they did this experiment where they, they put a, quite a young child, like a toddler, in a room with one marshmallow. And they say to them, I'm going to go out the room. If you can um, not eat that one marshmallow by the time I get back, I'll give you two. So there, it's, a, it's a kind of primary test of the ability to stop and be able to not eat that much money. And then they followed these kids up for many, many years into adulthood, and they found that the ones who were able to inhibit their response went on to kind of have stronger relationships and hold down a job and, you know, they got more money, and the, it, it predicted many, many things in life. So we know that these executive function skills are really, really important and also they're an area that kids with ADHD really struggle with. So Connections of Mind is an organisation where we're um, really trying to, um, well we offer, there are three areas in which we support people and, and this is something you could look into afterwards. We do individual coaching for children who really struggle with those skills. We have a parenting course um, that I'm going to talk a little bit about today but there's a six week parenting course and if you're interested um, we could definitely um, run one here so we, we need to just get a group of about 12 parents together and we could come and run once a six week course really focusing on thinking about how to embed executive function skill development in the home. And then um, we're also just about to launch this charity and we have um, um, a launch coming in the 14th of June in London. You, you can um, sign up to come. We've got some uh, very good speakers. And what we want to do is to raise awareness of executive function skills and how they impact on children, particularly because a lot of kids are getting punished for having poor executive function skills, particularly, I think, in education. Um, and we're not finding a way to teach them and train them and, and that's what we really hope trying to do with connections in mind. Okay, so th that was the first thing to think about with adolescent brain development. The other thing we know about adolescents is that they are particularly attracted to novel experiences. They feel things much more intensely. This is generally, with, generally within the population. And they're motivated to take more risks. Now, we all know that when we think about our own teenagers and think about ourselves when we were teenagers. But the brain research is now beginning to show it as well. So this is um, a slide that shows trends in sensation seeking. So the boys are over the top. They tend to take more risks than the girls. And you see it peaks around the age of 16 to 18. And people will say that this has probably been chosen by evolution as a very important, um, it's very important for us as a species. There's a period of time in our lives where we take risks. So it's about pushing boundaries and trying to, um, is this going funny? Yes. Yeah. Uh, Anyway, keep going. Keep going. Okay. Um, yeah. So, from an ev evolutionary point of view, that's probably very important. Um, I'm just going to play you um, a video. I'm about to make a life or death decision myself. Fortunately, only a virtual one. I'm at Temple University in Philadelphia, playing the stoplight game. I don't think so. <laughs> <laughs> just saved my life. We've all had the experience of trying to get someplace in a hurry, approaching an intersection, hitting a yellow light, and making a last minute decision about whether we want to go through or not. Right. And that's what this does. Oh, I would have made that for sure. I'm going to go through this. Uh, uh, I made it again. Oh, no, okay. Oh, so I get this broken windshield. That's probably my head that made this dent. <laughs> 
A more typical participant in the stoplight game is a teenager playing like Alex here while lying in an MRI machine. Okay, he made it through the first one without getting killed. He seems kind of lucky with these. I, mean, I would have stopped. Alex is deciding whether to put speed ahead of safety while he's alone in the scanner. But that, as far as Alex believes, is about to change. Hey, Alex, how you doing? Good. I have your friends here, and they're going to be watching you play the next round of tasks. So they're going to talk to you a little bit, OK? Hey, cool. All right, you can okay. just press that button. Hey, Alex, you still alive in there? Oh, yeah. Nice. Go ahead. Hey, Alex, it's Paul. How's it going? Pretty good. How you doing? I'm good, man. Good luck in there. We're going to be watching you. They're going to be watching me? Actually, they won't. But Alex doesn't know that. As far as he's concerned, his friends are watching his every choice. Crash. Bang. Is it my imagination, or is he having a few more crashes this time? No, he is having more crashes. And um, that's what we find, that when adolescents play this game, they crash more often when they know their friends are watching them than they do when they're by themselves. What happens with adults when they're uh, with friends or alone? Is there that much difference with adults? There's no difference at all. Really? In, in how they behave or in their patterns of brain activity. So when adults are alone and adolescents are alone, they look very similar. Mm. It's when you put adolescents with their friends that their behavior and their brain pattern changes. The brain pattern change is in the regions that respond to reward, principally in an area called the ventral striatum. When young people are alone playing the game, the ventral striatum remains quiet. But with friends around, it lights up. During adolescence, peers are so important that their presence activates the brain's reward circuitry, and that makes adolescents, under that condition, pay more attention to the potential rewards of a risky choice and less attention to the potential downside. Oh, bravo, you did a great job. Your friends are proud of you. <laughs> Just don't get in the car with them. <laughs> I've always assumed teenagers drive dangerously because friends in the car actively distract them. But just thinking the friends are watching and observing them, not even, not even passing judgment positively, on their behavior. It's something about the inherent rewarding value of, of people your age when you're an adolescent. And, and I think this has uh, you know, implications for understanding adolescent criminal behavior as, as well. Adolescents are much more likely than adults to commit crimes when they're in groups. And this research, I think, suggests that one of the reasons that that happens is that this effect of peers on reward sensitivity may also play a role in adolescents' judgment and decision making when they're in potentially criminal situations. Okay, so this has been replicated many, many times and in other situations. So they have this paradigm where um, what they have is four different conditions. You have adolescents on their own and with their friends and you have adults alone and with their friends. So this is the number of risks taken in this game. So the first thing to notice is that there's very little difference on their own between adolescents and adults. So it's not that adolescents can't make good decisions, but what you find is that with adults, when you put them with their peers, they make slightly more risks, but look what happens to peers when they're with their peer, um, to adolescents when they're with their peers, or even thinking the peers are watching them. So it's not about the behavior of the other children in the car, as he said, it's not about them egging them on. It's just, and what, what they say is, because peers and friends are so, so important. If we think about that lower brain, the lower brain becomes very activated. It's very, very rewarding um, to be with, with friends. And so it's harder to regulate behavior and to make good choices in that situation. So this is not, again, this has not been done for people with ADHD at the moment, um, but this is typically what happens during development. So this is a way of thinking about it at a neural level. 
this is development going up and age is going along the bottom. So this line here is the prefrontal cortex, that's the thinking brain, which develops more slowly than the emotional brain. That's the lower brain there. So there is this gap that they are saying is a kind of time of heightened risk during adolescence when their prefrontal cortex is reorganizing, the thinking brain is not working so well and becomes particularly activated when adolescents are with their peers. And one of the things you notice he said in that video is that adolescents pay more attention to the potential rewards of a risky choice and less attention to the potential downsides. So if you get them to fill in a questionnaire, they are rationally able to tell you what's important. And that's one of the frustrating things about adolescents is that you can sit with them and talk and have a very good conversation. You think, yeah, yeah, they're really sensible. They're not gonna do anything silly. But then when they're with their friends, their brains actually function differently. So they did um, an experiment in the States where they had some rats mice rather and again they had these four conditions adult mice alone adult mice with their peers adult mice um, adolescent mice alone and adolescent mice with their peers and they put them in cages and they gave them access to ethanol which is um, the equivalent of alcohol for mice and who do you think drank the most <laughs> So they did actually apply to ethics to try and get a grant to do this with humans, but they were turned down ethically. But I feel like certainly in North London we do this experiment every weekend. <laughs> so certainly when my kids, um, now 20 and 17, were coming towards the end of adolescence, well the 17 year olds in the middle of it really, but um, certainly when they are going off to a party, particularly if there are no adults around, I think it helps if there are some adults around, when there are no adults around and they say, no mum, it's going to be fine, you know, I'm not going to drink any alcohol, and I will say to them, your brains don't behave the same, your brain, you will make a different decision in that, in, in that situation, so I think we have to think really carefully. I don't know if you've heard about a free yard, have you heard about that? A free yard basically means the parents are out, don't let your kids go and don't give your kids a free yard. It's just, it's really not helpful for them during those teenage years because they can't make good decisions. And actually, not only do, can they make bad decisions, but they can actually get themselves in really difficult situations that can go on, perhaps traumatize them and they can regret for many years to come. So I think we have to really know this. I think we have to tell our kids about this. It's not about not having fun, but it's just about your brain behaves differently when you're with your friends. So again, um, when we're thinking about kids with ADHD, any effect generally seen in adolescence in this area is going to be heightened, I'm afraid, in kids with ADHD because it's related to the prefrontal cortex and they have this poor impulse control. But it's very hard to, for them to control their emotions. Um, their thinking brain does not switch on. I mean, it doesn't switch on as readily anyway, but I think during adolescence, because of this effect, it's going to be more significant. So they need more careful management. The third thing which is related is that the social world becomes crucially important during adolescence. So being part of the group is not just um, a kind of additional extra, I just want to hang out with my friends. At a brain level, it seems that there's some very important development that goes on in the social parts of the brain, again, something called the medial prefrontal cortex. And we're finding out that this is where kids learn to encode a lot of social information. Social inf information coding becomes much more complex during this time. So being part of the group is very, very important and it makes evolutionary sense as well because kids are getting ready. They're in this stage where they're getting ready from, from leaving their attachment figures from their birth family and going off and finding mates themselves. So evolution has chosen this as a time for kids to really need to be with their friends and to be part of the group. So inclusion in the group, it, if you look at brain scans, the reward centers in the brain light up much more for adolescents when you give 
when they're doing a task which is about group inclusion. We all like to be included in the group. All of us are very social. And all of us, our reward part of our brain will light up more. But for adolescents, it's significantly more. So it's very, very important to them. I think this has a lot of implication for thinking about phones, actually. We can talk about that maybe at the end. So inclusion is very important, but also we need to think about social pain. And there's some experiment, this, this really um, clever experiment has been done again, where they put people in a scanner, and they tell you that you are playing a game of catch with two other people. So you virtually throw this ball to each other, so the ball is being thrown three ways. And then after a while, they leave you out suddenly the ball doesn't get thrown to you at all. So they're trying to emulate social exclusion. And they look at what happened in the brain. And what they found was that the bit of the brain that lights up when we are in physical pain is the same bit of the brain that lights up when we have social pain. So at the brain level, social pain is as important. It's registered in the same way as if we were to break our leg. The other thing they found was that that did correlate with how you felt, so the people that said that they felt worse, their brain lit up more. And also, I don't tend to say this to kids, maybe I shouldn't say this to kids, cover their ears. <coughs> now, they're, now they're really going to listen. That uh, Tylenol, or the equivalent of paracetamol, makes the effect less, just like with physical pain. So if you take some paracetamol, um, it makes at the brain level, you register the social pain significantly less. So that's, I think, a very important thing for, um, for kids to know as well, the importance of social pain, and for us to know. And particularly when I think about when I talk to teachers, you know, I think the playground can be a pretty cruel place sometimes. And kids come in from the playground, kids who have been excluded, if they had cut their leg, we'd be saying, go and see the nurse and let's put a plaster on it. But when they have been socially excluded, their brain is registering at the same level and it's also pulling down this brain functioning again into the lower brain. Social pain is um, mu it's felt much more significantly in adolescents. So when they do that experiment, the adolescents feel the social pain much more. So it seems like um, adolescence is this sensitive, if we think about those windows of opportunity, it's this sensitive time for social rejection. And also it's important to remember that the social risk for them of being left out from their peers is much greater than any other negative outcomes. So whereas for a younger kid, you may be able to kind of say, you know, don't do that or you won't, I don't know, you'll lose some, uh, you know, you'll lose some sweets or something like that. If, if there is a social embarrassment, for example, in the classroom, the kids would much rather have the consequence, get the detention than look embarrassed in front of their friends. And I think we have to remember that, that that changes during adolescence. Young people with ADHD, we know, can struggle with social um, skills early. I mean, they have good social skills, but they can struggle with social relationships because their executive functions don't always act, you know, come online at the right time. And we also know that if you have been um, had social exclusion during your earlier years, you're much more sensitive to it later on. If there's been any bullying that's gone on earlier, um, that is a risk factor for social, ex you know, feeling that much more later in life. Um, so behavioral regulation amongst peers is an area of, of potential difficulty for this group. And the last thing just to say about adolescent brain development is that it's a time to develop these very specialist knowledge about ourself. So it seems that some of the bits of the brain where we develop a self-identity, a stable and um, full concept of who we are, this goes on during adolescence. So I think that helps us to understand this period of introspection, maybe the perpetual taking photos of yourself on the iPhone, um, and also often this social anxiety, so this sense that everybody is looking at you. But adolescents, you will know, just from being with them, are very, very sensitive to embarrassment and shame. But we're now beginning to understand it's because bits of the brain that are responsible for doing that encoding are going on during the adolescent years. We really need to think about self-identity um, in kids with ADHD. We need to always help them to have a good understanding of their strengths and weaknesses, have a very broad definition of success. 
Um, so, you know, many, many, uh, often we will focus on academic success as being the best success, but I think we have to have a much broader definition. And also provide the structures and scaffolds that allow them to be successful. Because I think if you are kind of unsuccessful during the adolescent years, that can really form your self-identity. Certainly that happened for me. I, I really didn't do very well at school. And I think I really left school with this self-identity, this idea that I wasn't very clever, that I wasn't very academically able. And I was fortunate to be able to come back to it later in life. But really that stayed with me for very many years and had this idea that, you know, this kind of thing called imposter syndrome where you're at a university and something goes wrong and then you go, oh my god, I shouldn't be here, they found me out. So this is a period when they're developing their identity, yeah. So there is kind of cosseting and not, or, uh, and not allowing them to have any experience. And then there's also the other end, which is that they're not safe and therefore they're at serious risk. And what I'm saying is that I think we need to protect them from the risk as much as we possibly can. I mean, I think there is something about this kind of idea of helicopter parenting, that you know, you do so much for them that they can't develop their independent skills. I'm not saying that. But what I'm saying is that in risky situations, particularly during adolescence and particularly for kids with ADHD, I think we have to think very carefully. And it's not necessarily about not letting them go, but actually there are various things you need to do around that experience that let them know that you're more present than you are. Like the scaffolding, exactly. So you make sure you know where, where they are, you make sure you have a phone number, you give them a time when they have to come home, all of those things. So you kind of, you know, are a presence there for them and they need that. They really need that during that time. You don't want to alienate them. No, no, you don't want to alienate them, absolutely. I mean, I think if all parents could know about this research and we could all be doing the same thing, then there wouldn't be any need for, you know, the increased risk. Particularly, I'm thinking, at, you know, quite young ages, parents are kind of um, giving free yards and saying, well, I'll just give them a couple of beers because it'll be more fun when they're 14, for example. And, and I, I think we really need to think carefully about what we're doing there. Maybe discuss with your neighbour, what do you think is a single factor that you have available to you that will help create a cushion to minimise stress for your child, help them make good decisions and develop their behavioural and emotional regulation? What do you think is the single most thing you have available to you? Think, yeah. Um, for me, I think it's in your, rela your relationship with your child and whether you can have a sort of really open discussion yeah. with your child and they feel they can approach you. Yeah. Absolutely. Spot on. It is your relationship. And I think we ju you just need to remember that that is your most powerful weapon, is your relationship with them, and you have to protect it with your life. There are many, many years um, of research and something called attachment theory. Have people heard of attachment theory? Yeah, I think it's quite well known now. Um, John Bowlby um, was a British researcher who was the first one to talk about it. But what he showed is that the child has this fundamental need to be in a positive relationship with a child. Sorry about that, knows. Um, the parent is the secure base and the safe haven from which the child can both go out and explore the world and can come back and help them to regulate when they're having difficulty. And it's fundamentally important to, for a child to have a healthy brain and to go on to be able to develop healthy relationships in life. So your relationship with them is the most important thing you have. So just Talk to your neighbour for one moment um, about a time when your teenager or your child um, had a difficult, when you had a difficult moment with them recently, if you can. Um, say what happened, just very briefly, what happened, how you responded and how successful the outcome was. I'm going to suggest maybe that what we need to do might be different from some other ways that you that people have talked to you about before but we can certainly have time to discuss it but the key thing is that how we respond to children's behavior when things go wrong really matters so there are many parenting techniques that will tell you that when your child kind of misbehaves or does something wrong you should give them a consequence for, for the behavior and this is usually done in the context of you feeling really angry and getting cross with them because it'll show you, show them that you mean it. 
One of the problems is that our disapproval and anger causes the child to be in crisis because our relationship with them is so fundamentally important. It pushes their functioning into the lower brain that I was just talking about and um, it actually causes a real difficulty because a positive, they, they really need to be in a positive relationship with you. Your disapproval is a bit of a crisis for them. And in fact, I was reading an article only today in a magazine called Mother Jones, if you want to look it up. It's a really great American magazine where there's this article written that says there is something about parental disapproval that is instinctively repellent. It may even be bad for your health. So many of you will have talked about rewards and reinforcements. Now these are important. So behave positive reinforcement, if you give something um, positive after a behavior you want more of, it's more likely to increase. Negative reinforcement, if you take something away um, from a behavior you want to, it's more likely to increase. Does that make sense? So those are things that are very, very important. We need to bear them in mind. So if your child is having a tantrum in, the, in saying, I want the sweet, and you say, you can't have it, I want the sweet, and they scream and scream and scream, and then you give it to them, you have reinforced the behavior that of screaming because they say, I might as well do that again because I get the sweet. So that is very important. And behavioral approaches are wonderful when they work, but they often temporarily change behavior without addressing the underlying issue from which the behavior emerges. So you often get short-term gains, but maybe you get long-term problems. And maybe, maybe, research is beginning to show that maybe it can be quite damaging to children's mental health later in life. So this model that I'm going to talk about is more, um, it's, it's really more of a, this is like an iceberg. So the idea is that above on the top of the iceberg is what we see, which is the behavior. So we see the shouting and the, and the shutting down and the I hate you. But what we need to work out is what is going on underneath for the child, particularly what is happening in that lower brain. And if we think about brain functioning, we need to know what's going on because if we can solve this problem, if we can help them with this, they can let go of the behavior because behavior is only ever a form of communication. Behavior is a reflection of what's going on underneath in the iceberg. So behavioral approaches that I've just been talking about, the problem with them is that they ignore the emotion or the struggle. They give kids the message that they need to sort their own problems out. They also don't give them an awareness of what is happening. They don't help them to understand what's going on emotionally. And they don't give them the skills that they need to change behavior so they will do that thing the next time. So the problem with time out, for example, which is something that's often used, time out is often given in anger and therefore it can be quite punitive. It's usually too long, it becomes disconnected from the original sin, so kids don't really know why they're, why they're doing it. The child who is sitting alone in time out is not carefully reflecting on what they did. When they hit their sibling and you say, go to your room and think about what you did, they are not thinking about what they did. They're not sitting there thinking, I wonder why I hit my sibling. What made me, they, they don't know what's going on. They're just thinking, I hate mum and mum loves my sister much more than they love me. So they're not doing the thinking we want them to be doing. The brain is wired to repeat experiences because of these circuits that we're building. So it teaches the child to be alone when they've made a mistake or when they're feeling very, very emotional. And that I think can be very dangerous later on because what we know from the teenage um, brain that brain research is that we get this very heightened lower brain experience so emotions become very very intense during adolescence if you've taught kids early on in their childhood go and sit and be alone when you feel something I don't want to see the bad child I don't want to see the angry child I only want to see the good one then when they get to their teenagers and they feel really bad they've learned to sit on their own you really want them to come to you and also it's a lost opportunity to make this connection we have this brain plasticity we can help them make the connection between the lower brain and the upper brain it gives them no insight into what's happened they don't know what to do all they remember is that the adult was angry with them so i'm just going to play you this video now um, from brené brown
So what is empathy and why is it very different than sympathy? Empathy fuels connection. Sympathy drives disconnection. Empathy, it's very interesting. Teresa Wiseman is a nursing scholar who studied professions, very diverse professions where empathy is relevant and came up with four qualities of empathy. Perspective taking, the ability to take the perspective of another person or, or recognize their perspective as their truth. Staying out of judgment, not easy when you enjoy it as much as most of us do. <laughs> Recognizing emotion in other people and then communicating that. Empathy is feeling with people. And to me, I always think of empathy as this kind of sacred space when someone's kind of in a deep hole and they shout out from the bottom and they say, I'm stuck, it's dark, I'm overwhelmed. And then we look and we say, hey, and climb down. I know what it's like down here, and you're not alone. Sympathy is, ooh, <laughs> it's bad, uh-huh. <laughs> uh, no, you want a sandwich? <laughs> um, empathy is a choice, and it's a vulnerable choice, because in order to connect with you, I have to connect with something in myself that knows that feeling. Rarely, if ever, does an empathic response begin with at least. I had a, yeah. And we do it all the time. Because you know what? Someone just shared something with us that's incredibly painful, and we're trying to silver lining it. I don't think that's a verb, but I'm using it as one. We're trying to put the silver lining around it. So I had a miscarriage. Oh, at least you know you can get pregnant. I think my marriage is falling apart. At least you have a marriage. <laughs> John's getting kicked out of school. At least Sarah is an A student. But one of the things we do sometimes in the face of very difficult conversations is we try to make things better. If I share something with you that's very difficult, I'd rather you say, I don't even know what to say right now. I'm just so glad you told me. Because the truth is, rarely can a response make something better. What makes something better is connection. The point of it is that in order to be truly empathetic with anybody, I mean, this really reply, applies to any relationship, but I think with our, for def, definitely with our kids, we need to do these four things. We need to, have, to take their perspective, so it may not be the same perspective as us. It's the most awful thing. I wasn't invited to that party. Oh, it doesn't matter. There's going to be another party next week. You're not taking their perspective. You have to take their perspective. Stay out of judgment. It doesn't matter if such and such it, it, it does to them. You have to stay out of judgment about what they're... You have to recognize the emotion in others. And with kids, I think we have to name the emotion in, in them. We have to help them to understand the emotion they're feeling. And then, this is the hardest one, I think, as a parent. You have to feel a bit of that emotion. And it's very, very painful if your child is feeling sad if your child is feeling anxious, it can be very, very hard for us to tolerate as parents because we feel it so intensely. So what we tend to do is to try and make it better. We either try to change the world or we say it doesn't matter. But what she says is that rarely can a response make something better. What makes something better is connection. And I would like to, um, I think this is sometimes to when you start to do this, it's hard to get your head round. But I think um, there's some really interesting research um, here, which shows um, that the support, so basically what they did, again, they put people in the scanner, um, and these actually were adults, but they put an electrode on their toe, and it actually gave them an electric shock. There were two conditions. Either you saw a red cross, which meant you were safe, or you saw a blue circle. If you saw the blue circle, it meant that there was a 20% chance you were going to have an electric shock. And then they looked at what bit of the brain lit up, and they found that the fear bit of the brain lit up when you saw the blue circle, as you would expect. Then what they did was they got your primary attachment figure, the person you were very close to, to come and hold your hand. And what they found was that that fear bit of the brain lit up significantly less. 
They've done this with other things. So if you're standing at the bottom of a hill, you will perceive the hill to be less steep if you're with your attachment figure. And so they have come up with a theory that they call social baseline theory. And what this says is that the feeling of connection with another person is our most efficient way of regulating distress. Actually, we are so high, hardwired for social proximity. Social relationships are so important that we use somebody else's brain as a form of stress reduction. Just being with your attachment figure means that your brain registers things to be less frightening than they really are. So it tells us something really important about what we need to do when someone is emotionally distressed. And you will probably all have had the experience of being upset about something and your partner comes home and often men, although also women, sorry I don't mean to pigeonhole you, but men will come in and try and fix it. Usually because they love you so much and you say I had a horrible time and my friend said this really, really hurtful thing and they'll say well, I've never liked her and just don't see her again and you're like no, 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 she's my best friend. I, I don't, or they try to fix the world and actually you just go all I want you to do is give me a hug and that is what this is about it's this idea that you get in the pit with your child when they're really struggling there's another um, experiment done with kids and actually this came about um, just by mistake they were scanning the brain of children who were really anxious and because they were really anxious the kids wanted their mums to come and stand next to them and so the researchers said yeah but it might really skew the results and actually they said let's see what happens and it did really skew the results because just having the parent next to them meant that the fear plot of their brain that they were scanning lit up significantly less so it's beginning to show in children that is also the case so if when our children are really distressed and we know that distress the good measure of how emotional they are feeling is their behavior the more extreme the behavior is correlated with the more extreme emotion we say to them go away we are actually doing the oppos opposite of what we should be doing when our kids are really distressed and this includes when they're shouting at us because shouting is a form of being emotionally distressed we actually need to have them close to us Kids need us to help them to, underst help them to understand their feelings. They need us to help them regulate their emotions, to develop this pathway, to help them work out what to do to change their behavior next time. Their behavior is a form of communication which is saying, I'm lost, I don't know what to do with my feelings, I need you. And we will often hear rejection, we'll hear demands that make no sense, we'll hear anger. But we need to change our mindset about bad behavior and be with our kids and get in the pit with them and help them to understand and work out what's going on. So in the face of difficult behavior, we need to check our own behavior. We need to keep our cool. We need to refuse to engage in that battle. We need to express empathy for what they're feeling and gently but firmly enforce the rules. Now this is not about not having any boundaries because boundaries are as important. But we can't control their behavior, but we absolutely can control our own behavior. And one of the things that might help is to think about where in the brain that child is functioning in that moment. What I would really recommend is to establish a time for reflection when you are both in your thinking brain. When your child is in their emotional brain, there is no point in having any of this conversation with them. Don't try and talk to them at that time. It's only going to make things worse. But establish a, a, a separate time, which is a regular time, which is a nice time. It's not a telling off time. It's a time when you can discuss family rules. And actually, when kids are in their thinking brain, you will be surprised about how rational they can be. And you say, you know, I find that I'm having to remind you 20, 30 times to turn off the PlayStation. How many times do you think I should... Should we, should we give it a try? How many times do you think I should remind you? I, I've had this with parents and kids will say, well, twice will be fine. And you go, okay, let's try twice. When I've done once, I'm going to do this. When I've done twice, and let's see how that goes. And then you try it with them and go, ah, okay, we're on to number three. And they're having a meltdown, so you leave it for then. And then you come back to your regular time and you say again, okay, two didn't work. What should we try this time? So you try to make it collaborative. You say, I think when you were screaming, when you told me to, um, I won't swear, but to uh, bugger off, I think you were feeling really angry. I think that was going on. When you said to me, I hate you, 
actually, I don't, I think at that time you were feeling really angry. Do you think that was what's going on? You know how kids come to you afterwards and they go, I'm really sorry, mum, I really didn't mean it. And they feel really bad. Well, these kids carry a lot of shame because when they say those things, they're in their lower brain. Um, so we need to help them to understand that. Um, boundary setting is so, so important. It's just as important as true empathy, particularly for kids with ADHD. But allow some negotiation, particularly, particularly during adolescence, so they feel like they have some autonomy, so they feel like they've had some say in the rules. Supporting the development of executive function skills gives them independence. It gives them this sense of competence. And allow for mistakes. I mean, apart from the fact that adolescence is a time of risk-taking, it's a time of trial and error. That's what their brain is telling them to do. We need to allow kids to make mistakes and help them to do better next time. Just to say that if you want an extended version of this talk, which is over six weeks, to really kind of get into the nitty gritty of it, there is this course that we're offering. Um, and also we're launching this, this charity, which is all about executive function skills. So please do look that up as well. And thank you very much.